Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Julia Santucci, and I am a senior lecturer in intelligence studies at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh, where I also direct the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership and the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum. Before we begin our lecture today, I'd like to share a brief background as to why we're all here. The Hesselbein Forum is the namesake of Francis Hesselbein, who grew up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And in 1932, Francis enrolled in the University of Pittsburgh campus there. Although she did not complete her degree at Pitt at that time, she has since earned over 22 honorary doctoral degrees, including one from Gispia, where I now teach. Frances began her career as a volunteer Girl Scout troop leader in Johnstown, and she went on to become the CEO of the Girl Scouts of the USA, where she transformed and diversified that organization. For this work, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian honor, by President Bill Clinton in 1998. Just days after retiring from the Girl Scouts, Frances founded a nonprofit organization whose mission was to strengthen the leadership of the social sector through publications, events, and programs. That organization transformed into what is now the Hesselbein Forum within the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership here at Pitt. Frances is still very much with us. She's working daily from her office in New York City, and she continues to inspire us all with her commitment to values-based leadership. Our mission at the Hesselbein Forum is to develop and inspire current and future leaders. We do this by publishing the most contemporary insights on leadership in our award-winning Leader to Leader Journal, supporting graduate students through leadership development training and coaching, gathering students, faculty, and staff, and the greater Pittsburgh public to leadership lectures through this program, the Hesselbein Lecture Series. Most of our previous lectures are online, so please do take advantage of that resource. Before I turn to our current speaker, I also just wanna say that the Hesselbein Forum would not be possible without the work of our dedicated staff and student employees. Doreen Hernandez, our administrator at the Johnson Institute, Teresa Baranato, our director of communications, Tiffany Monsal, Francis Hesselbein's executive assistant, and Taylor, Sarah, and Chloe, our student workers, all have contributed time and time again to making events like this possible. So it seems like an understatement to say that 2020 has been a challenging year. The COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to over a million deaths globally and it's wreaked havoc on our lives. It has also exposed longstanding racial and gender inequities in our societies here in the United States and around the world. People of color in America are exposed to and dying from the disease at disproportionate rates. Nationwide, black people are dying at 2.3 times the rate that white people do. Globally, women comprise over 70% of healthcare workers, but they are vastly underrepresented in leadership and decision-making positions as we respond to this pandemic. Rates of gender-based violence have skyrocketed around the world. Women are more likely to lose their jobs because of the pandemic and an estimated 20 million girls worldwide will never return to school. But in our view, this is not the time to despair. Rather, it's a time to seek out competent, ethical leaders who can guide us through this era of change to create a healthier, safer, more equitable world. Nothing short of transformational leadership will do. We think that the initiatives Heather Anderson is leading at Global Health Corps are transformational, and we are so delighted to have her here with us today. As CEO of Global Health Corps, Heather provides leadership, management, and vision to drive GHC's mission to mobilize a global community of health equity leaders. She addresses the diversity and leadership gap in global health by working to train cross-cultural, collaborative, resilient leaders across sectors who can challenge these gaps. In short, GHC recruits and trains diverse leaders to build and strengthen health systems throughout their careers. Prior to GHC, Heather worked with public and private sector initiatives and organizations, including the Gates Foundation, Women Deliver, GlaxoSmithKline Vaccines, and Planned Parenthood Global. We will learn more about Heather's background during this discussion, and we have a lot to learn from her today. 
So Heather, welcome virtually to Pitt and to the Hasselbein Forum. And I will turn things over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you to uh, the Hesselbein Leadership Institute team for inviting me today. And thanks to all of you who are joining us for this hour. As you heard from Julia, I'm Heather Anderson, CEO at Global Health Corps. I thought I'd start today by first sharing a little bit about my own professional journey. I began my career as a management consultant in the private sector. I was wearing business suits during my first weeks um, at Anderson Consulting, uh, which is now known as Accenture. And while I gained invaluable experience and skills I still use to this day, I always had a passion for women's rights and gender equality. And so in my late 20s, I decided to follow this passion. I quit my job as a consultant in Chicago packed up my things, and I drove a U-Haul truck across the country to Washington, DC. Here you see me in one of these illustrious business suits that I mentioned um, that I wore in the mid-90s. Um, but when I left that behind and moved to Washington, DC, I was really determined to break through and start the next stage of my career. And so 40 informational interviews and many cups of coffee later in DC, I ended up at Planned Parenthood Global, which set me on the path that has taken me to where I am now. But I wanna be clear, my path was not linear. It zigzagged up, down and all around. And this is pretty reflective for many of us in the global health field. There isn't one path, one right answer, and it's up to all of us to figure out our own journeys. If you're listening today and you're not sure how you quite fit in, please know that there is a role for everyone in the movement for health equity. You just have to figure out what it is. And so on this new path, uh, I learned that my skills and experience, though not directly health related, equipped me to lead projects, manage teams uh, who were working to make a difference in the sector. I saw that we couldn't tackle complex health challenges unless we invited people in with non-medical skills and many different perspectives into this work. At Global Health Corps, we believe that leadership, specifically effective, diverse leadership, has immense power to save and improve lives. It's our quote, steel curtain defense, to take a Pittsburgh phrase, against crises like COVID-19, yet it is often misdefined and underappreciated. Because right here in Pittsburgh, I'm sure you've, many of you have seen examples of both great and less than great leadership throughout this crisis. And because it's whether it's on the football field or spearheading a national response to the pandemic, it's important to recognize and cultivate traits required to lead in today's world. Empathy, humility, the ability to adapt and innovate, and a deep commitment to collaboration. And we have to build these leadership skills, our own and in others, before a crisis strikes, because a crisis does reveal who we all are. That's why I joined Global Health Corps in 2012. I was inspired by the vision of our CEO, Barbara Bush, the small but mighty team she had assembled, and a mission that really spoke to my heart. We celebrated our 10th anniversary back in January before the world changed. It was a big deal because we started, as you'll see here, with just 22 fellows back in 2009. This is just some of them. They took a leap of faith on a brand new program, and now our community is over a thousand strong. Throughout all these years, we have had two guiding beliefs, that health is a human right, and the right kind of leaders working together is the greatest lever for change. If you look closely, you'll see that all major progress in history is a story of people coming together across differences, to achieve some common goal. It's radically simple, <laughs> but also very messy, long time work. So the entry point to Global Health Corps is our 13 month fellowship where fellows fill capacity gaps at health organizations in Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, and Zambia. Pictured here are some of our fellows and alumni in Rwanda 
with Dr. Agnes Benawaho, who was Rwanda's Minister of Health and now leads the University of Global Health Equity, one of GHG's placement organizations for fellows. Other partners that fellows work at include ministries of health, large INGOs like PATH or Partners in Health, as well as smaller grassroots organizations. The GHC Fellowship provides frontline global health experience, leadership development training through quarterly retreats, and is a community of like-minded advocates. We've designed our own curricula grounded in the pillars of authentic and collective leadership, systems and design thinking, with a focus on developing leadership traits like resilience, vulnerability, and commitment to learning. A key part of our program is our co-fellow model. We pair an international fellow with a national fellow who work and learn from each other. COVID has required us to place pause on placing any international fellows in our current cohort. So we have an amazing group of African nationals who are working on the front lines of health equity for this current year. Our alumni community is extremely tight knit and our focus is harnessing the power of this collective group of leaders. We're deepening our program for alumni because this is really where we see long-term change happening, providing them with the resources, opportunities, and access to networks to maximize their impact. Our offerings include management and advocacy training, regional leadership summits, one-on-one -on -one coaching, seed funding for initiatives, and much more. Pictured here are some of our alumni chapter leaders in Malawi distributing sanitation and PPE supplies at schools in Lilongwe. This year, we also launched a collective action coalition for COVID-19 where eight teams of alumni working to address health system gaps in their own communities. Here's one of our Ugandan alums who's part of the Uganda coalition observing social distance regulations while documenting health needs in a village in Busia district. Overall, our staff at Global Health Corps has been firing on all cylinders to keep driving our mission forward over the past six months. They are working day in and day out to support our thousand person community and demonstrating the same adaptability and flexibility we train our own fellows on. We've also deepened our programming at the intersection of racial justice and health equity. Globally, racism is a social determinant of health, so health leaders have to intentionally address it. More broadly, we want to lead by example in taking a stand against white supremacy within global development, acknowledging the sector's colonial roots and enacting a true power shift. Pictured here are some of our alums in Lusaka, Zambia, marching in solidarity with Black Lives Matter's protests back in June, and also some New York City-based alums doing the same. So who are we looking to join us in our community? First, a bit about our fellows and our alumni. Our fellows specifically are around 26 years or so. Um, we are very generation specific of wanting to bring in the um, next generation of leaders. So all of our fellows come in under the age of 30. They're highly diverse. They work across health issues and functions, whether that's data, finance, engineering, program management, architecture, supply chain, you name it. So a medical or health experience or background is not required. Neither Fabrice nor Anne, the co-fellows picture here, had technical health skills before joining GHC, but now they're committed advocates. But self-awareness, commitment to social justice, and potential to mobilize and inspire others are required. We select on these qualities and we wanna keep growing them. So we call them our leadership practices, but because they are skills that you need to practice throughout your lifetime. Here are co-fellows Greg and Edith practicing the ability to inspire and mobilize. They overcame their nerves to give a speech on their vision for global health equity to a couple hundred people at the start of their fellowship program. 87% of our alumni stay in global health and social impact, rising to greater roles of leadership and influence because they care deeply about serving their communities. They work in more than 40 countries and across 400 plus organizations. Here's me with three of our alumni last year participating in the Women Leaders in Global Health Conference in Rwanda. 
I'm also going to share a picture of some of our alumni rubbing shoulders with some global health rock stars like Paul Farmer from Partners in Health and Dr. Tedros of the WHO. So if you're listening in and you'd like to join us, I've got good news. On December 2nd, we'll open applications for our next class of fellows. We'll be recruiting up to 50 young leaders, ages 21 to 30, Americans and African nationals in our operating countries, Malawi, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia. I'll share more information on ways to connect with our work or join in the health equity movement later. So that's a little bit about me and that's Global Health Corps. I wanna leave you with two lessons that are top of mind for me. And I think they're important for all aspiring leaders to keep in mind. First, that the world is waking up to the reality that our futures are deeply entwined with those of others. We are only as healthy or safe as the people, one room, apartment building, street or nation over from us. A virus like COVID-19 does not care about man-made borders. So there is no national solution to a global health crisis. We need collaboration across sectors, across silos for the future, and we have to have an unrelenting commitment to equity. Amit Salvi, a 2009-10 fellow and engineer who is now leading a contact tracing initiative with Partners in Health in Illinois says, quote, our first priority shouldn't be how do we solve the simplest cases? It should be how do we support the most complex and difficult ones? How do we design a program and implement it in a way that doesn't leave the vulnerable as an afterthought? I hope you'll each carry this mindset and way of working with you wherever your leadership journeys take you. And second, as leaders, we have to expand our horizons and challenge our assumptions in the harmful single narratives we're fed about where wisdom and leadership comes from. Specifically, in our work, we've seen so much innovation and wisdom coming from Sub-Saharan Africa during the pandemic. Because of Ebola and HIV, many Sub-Saharan countries have experienced infrastructure and understanding of how to handle a rapidly spreading virus like COVID. We're seeing innovative leaders across the continent applying lessons learned to protect and save lives with limited resources. A powerful example of how the GHC community is rising to meet the, these challenges is our alumna Temi Hiwatubason. Post fellowship, Temi leveraged the GHC network and with her increased confidence as a leader, she founded LifeBank a company dedicated to delivering life-saving blood and medical supplies to women in delivery across Nigeria. As the pandemic swooped in, Temi and her team adapted their logistics to also deliver PPE and oxygen to dozens of clinics, saving countless lives. This is the kind of innovation, adaptability, and future we see our community driving forward. As Westerners, and especially for those of us who are white and otherwise privileged, exhibiting humility and flexibility is key. For anyone wanting to lead authentically, we have to engage in regular self-reflection, dialogue, and a critical examination of how our intersectional identities influence how we show up to lead. So I hope you won't shy away from this tough but necessary work. I can say from my experience that it's a hard but rewarding journey. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Julia and the team to open up Q&A. Thank you, Heather. Um, that was remarkable. I didn't tell Heather that I'm a Pittsburgh native and lifelong Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So <laughs> I will definitely be using that quote um, from you about effective diverse leadership being the world's steel curtain defense. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> Audience, we are going to um, open things up in a minute for Q&A from you. Uh, so if you can use the Q&A feature in the webinar to type any questions that you have. Um, but before we get to the audience questions, I did wanna just engage in a little bit of a discussion with you, Heather. Um, and I think maybe the first question that I'll ask is you are a woman leading an organization in a sector where women are underrepresented, um, talk, especially in leadership positions, uh, mm -hmm. as I even mentioned earlier in my remarks. 
And then you're also a wife, you're a mother, you're a lifelong gender equity advocate. And so how do these intersecting identities relate to your approach to your work and um, how do they influence how you approach this role as CEO of Global Health Corps? Sure, thanks, Julia. I think first and foremost, when I think about um, sort of these intersecting identities or otherwise, that it really helps that I was raised by parents who never saw gender as an obstacle to doing anything in life. So that very much fed my value system, um, which has been important to hold on to throughout my own journey. And, and they also are ones that, that align with our work at Global Health Corps, you know, equity and through the lens of sustainable resilience of managing work and being a mom um, and being a partner and, uh, you know, navigating through the ups and downs of all of that. Also through the importance of collaboration because you cannot just do it alone. And so being able to know and figure out how to engage and collaborate with others. Um, because importantly for me, having a network during this time, um, not only now, but throughout my life has been really important. And at GHC, a fundamental part of our work is building this network because being able to rely on especially peers and mentors of uh, often women um, has really helped me through all kinds of transitions in my life. And you know, the GHC community is majority female and we intentionally invest in them with a huge emphasis on building their voices and confidence, but also working to shift the leadership paradigm overall so that traditionally some of the feminine traits such as um, empathy, humility, self-reflection are embraced and cultivated in all leaders. Um, and then maybe I just say lastly, that for me, even though I'd say quite honestly, early in my career as a consultant, while I was, uh, you know, sort of taught that personal life is here and your professional life is here and you just do your work, I have found that as especially I stepped into the role of CEO with our team and during this challenging time of COVID, it's been important even more so to be authentic. And you know, my team knows that I'm a working mother and I also had a husband that had COVID um, during this time and just really being able to share these experiences and give personal updates and have others feel comfortable sharing what they're going through and being supportive during this time has also been such an important part um, as we were thinking about what all of these parts of our own lives look like. Yeah, we talk a lot um, at the Johnson Institute about the importance of empathy. And I think that really comes through in what you're talking about, especially in this time as we are all working from home. I mean, some of you probably heard my dogs barking in the background as I'm trying to <laughs> ask a question. And um, the, the personal and the professional are certainly melding in ways that um, you're right, especially for women in the workforce, even when I entered my my own career about 15 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, you sort of were taught to keep those things separate. And now mm -hmm. um, maybe a benefit of this pandemic is we're bringing the two together. Mm -hmm. I, um, I started my career as a leadership analyst um, in the intelligence community where we assessed leaders. And I, I worked on the Middle East. So assessing and looking at and analyzing leaders in that part of the world, um, at least government leader is not so inspirational. Um, but that that career really taught me how to um, examine the leadership traits and skills and styles of others and try to learn from those. And so I was wondering if you could talk about maybe a leader or two that's been particularly inspirational in your life or who you have tried to um, model your own leadership style after. Sure. Um... What a fascinating career you must have had, Julia. Lots of stories, I have no doubt. Uh, um, a leader that comes to mind um, of respect and sort of admiration really is uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the former president of Liberia, who was Liberia's first female president and one who was able to support transition of her country to peaceful democracy. Um, in addition, not only being such an amazing leader for her country, 
for um, the region, for the world. She also has such passion and commitment to gender equality, you know, particularly for girls and women, and continues to pursue leadership, um, really recognizing the power of people because, you know, as we always say at GHC, we truly believe that leadership is the greatest lever for change and that often so much of the focus is on the coolest new technology or what's the new medicine and the reality is there's no silver bullet and so I really respect President Sirleaf's focus on people and leaders and her continuation of that focus throughout her very lengthy and prestigious career. Yeah, she is certainly an inspirational leadership. And you're right. I also worked in the gender equality space um, at the State Department. And right, she was somebody that we all also looked to um, for inspiration and really as a model for what women can achieve in the world. Um, I see another question in the chat and um, I'm giving preference to people named Julia when <laughs> asking the first question. Um, so Julia in the chat asks, the story of your colleague innovating on PPE delivery is really interesting. Are there any lessons that us in the US could learn from your colleagues in the African countries where you work, um, such as flexibility, different ways of doing things, et cetera? I'd say the short answer is yes. And um, you know, I think quite honestly, there was a mis misstep early on in the pandemic that there wasn't a lot or enough of engagement with countries who had been dealing with epidemics beforehand and what really is needed to be adaptive and innovative. Um, because I think many, many people's jobs, particularly healthcare workers or otherwise, um, were just thrown out the window. And you know, new playbooks were written and figuring that out. Um, and so what for me comes to mind as an example is we had fellows this past year when the pandemic struck in Uganda that were working in the Ministry of Health there and they were working in the mental health unit. And when the pandemic struck, one of the first things that our fellows did were, were, were to reach out to our network and to say, we know that others in the GHC community had worked on Ebola in West Africa and had done a lot of pandemic or epidemic response at that time, working with emergency healthcare workers and mental health response. So instead of having to start over from scratch, really tapping into the experts who had been working in West Africa, taking their materials, adapting it to a more Uganda context so that they could more quickly be able to get the materials, the resources, the support that frontline health workers were gonna need from a mental health perspective. And so I would just say that so often people just think that we need to start things from scratch. And I would really encourage us to think about what are communities, what are experts, who are the people in the communities that are being affected? They are the ones that will tell you what is needed. Um, it doesn't always have to be from a major top-down approach, but that it could really be the people are most effective for where you can start figuring out the solutions. And they also don't always have to take a ton, ton of money. And it was, um, I think, such an important part of your remarks at the beginning too, to say that we can learn something from other countries, particularly in Africa. I mean, so often we view Africa as the target of our development. And of course, I mean, the United States, the global um, community has invested a lot in Africa, but there's also a lot that we can learn from them. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing these stories. Mm -hmm. I think, especially in this current moment, it's just so important that we're not starting from scratch, not reinventing the wheel um, and learning from yeah. one another. Absolutely. So we have um, a pretty diverse mix of attendees out there, some who are already into their careers, some who are just trying to start out their careers as graduate students, um, and then of course some educators, including um, our, our brand new Dean at Gispia, Carissa Slatterbeck. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna ask kind of a, a question with two variations. Um, okay. So Dean Slatterbeck has asked, how do we best prepare students to do the kind of work that you and Global Health Corps are involved in? So what advice would you give to us as educators? 
And then um, on the sort of other side of that, we have many students in the audience who have been posting into the Q&A. Um, what advice would you give to them as they're starting out their careers of what, what skills can they be working to develop um, while they're in graduate school, whether it's in a public health program or in a public policy program? Um, so what advice do you have for us educators and then also for our students in the audience? Sure. So perhaps, and some of this may be on both sides of the question, but also feel free, Julia, if I'm not fully answering the questions. Um, I mean, I think, first and foremost, it's amazing that um, as we've you know, talked even before joining for the call today, how much alignment there is about the approach uh, of leadership the Global Health Core has and the approach um, that you have in your programs at Pitt. And I'd say that that's still in some ways like relatively novel um, from the standpoint of really talking about resiliency, empathy, sustainability. I have sat in for many years at meetings with high level senior executives, um, whether it's private sector, public sector, government, talking about these skills and our leadership approach to a lot of really blank faces or people saying, but we need to have the epidemiologists who know how to do X, Y, Z. And I never say no, but we need them. And we also need to be working to train them on these other skills, um, particularly if they are Americans that are going to be working somewhere else. That cross-cultural understanding, collaboration, um, engagement, is so necessary and that the way to be thinking about leadership, it is that it is not just a top-down approach, that it is at any stage of your career, you can be a leader stepping in to practice these skills. And so what I'd both say like as educators is to bring this into curricula. You know, I think so often especially it's one thing if you're a part of a leadership program, but a number of other you know, programs, and I have my MPH, but so often it's just focused on the hard skills and those are absolutely important, but I just wanna to continue to encourage uh, you know, graduate schools to think about what are the other leadership skills that you can be weaving in, you could be adding to really have a more well-rounded um, professional be entering into the workforce because even in many nonprofits or those sort of things, they're not going to receive uh, explicit leadership training. I mean, this is the reason why, you know, Global Health Corps is filling this gap that so often there's not professional development in leadership. So especially as educators, you have that time to, you know, really engage and reach and figure out what does that look like um, for these various leadership skills that, you know, that Global Health Corps we think are important and I'd say for those who are continuing on in their journey after graduate school, you know, first and foremost, know that, as we keep saying, it's a practice in the sense of, number one, it doesn't mean that you are born with it or not born with it. Um, but number two, to also say it doesn't necessarily just happen overnight. And that really the part of, you know, a lot of our curricula work of the self-reflection and digging into the hard conversations and uh, critical thinking is so important. And that's something that as your own leadership journey continues that you can be finding, you know, there's so many more virtual online courses that are happening. And so really take advantage of those really, you know, as part of either your undergrad or undergraduate community, you know, still being active or involved um, in that network. I say, especially during graduate school, definitely be heads down and you know try to do your best at school, but also recognize all those other resources that are available to you, let alone all the amazing people that you meet, because that's going to be part of your network throughout your professional journey as you finish graduate school. I did not pay Heather to say that, but I <laughs> completely agree. Um, this is something that I am constantly preaching to my students of make sure that you not only focus on, of course, doing well in your courses and getting your reading and memo assignments done, but also take advantage of opportunities like this where you can hear from people, um, you know, working in the field. I also, um, I appreciated what you said about leadership skills being something you can learn, um, but that you do have to practice throughout a career. 
Uh, and that's certainly something that we subscribe to at the Hustlebine Forum, at the Johnson Institute, and, and try to you know, instill in our students and our community members. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, just your own maybe leadership journey and what are those skills that you have most relied upon? And especially, um, I mean, we talk about leadership being something you can exercise at every level, but you are of course now at the top of an organization. <laughs> um, and so in addition to exercising leadership, you also have to fill this executive management role. And so what are the skills that you found um, you know, most useful to you, especially in your current role that you've been, but that you've been developing throughout your career? Sure. Well, I was being very truthful when I said, you know, my six years as a management consultant really gave me quite a number of skills that I've used to this day. So I say that was sort of an initial foundational set of project management, team management, all of the work that I did as an early career professional was working in teams, was facilitating meetings, was how do you drive through deadlines? What do you do when it looks like you're not going to hit the deadline and being able to still be nimble and adaptable and flexible? And so those skills um, were really important to me. And I realized, uh, you know, some of the time when I moved over to the public sector, that because people had been spending their time really working on committed issues, social justice or otherwise, that they hadn't necessarily been exposed to some of the classic project management skills or how to fully execute a project. And so uh, being able for me to be able to learn from them of the issues and get up to speed, because that's not what I had been doing for my six years, but also to be sharing my learning um, so that together we could be having a much more um, sort of engaged and productive work at wherever I was in the organization. So I think that speaks to both having the management skills. I think as part of it's also the collaboration. I very much enjoy and thrive in working in teams and having had that practice throughout the majority of my career in many different ways, I think has been really important to I think part of it as well, as I've you know, mentioned earlier, sort of being authentic of who you are, especially um, I like to have an environment at our or at Global Health Corps where people, no matter where they are in the organization, could feel comfortable coming to me or coming to anyone else in the organization and bringing ideas or questions or concerns. And while that's not always perfect, you know, that's something that for me feels really important to continue to strive for. And then I'd say too, um, you know, obviously being able to engage in, uh, you know, with lots of different types of people from stakeholders who are at the executive level to community members, to our fellows, alumni, to our placement organization. So really building, especially if you're going to work in the global health space, those cross-cultural sort of muscles and skills um, is really important. And that continues to be a learning journey, especially, you know, for me, particularly in an executive role. Your focus on collaboration, I think, um, goes nicely into a question from one of the students in our audience, um, Justin Dada, who has um, a PhD student in uh, the health fields, but then also a GISPIA student as well. So with a policy bent, and he asks, mm -hmm. how do you foster a collaborative environment with governments, funding, technology, and healthcare workers that may have different priorities? So how do you work across all of these different um, constituencies that don't often share the same the same goals even mm -hmm. thanks justin for the question i uh, um would say that first and foremost it is the relationships it's building and working to build trusting relationships with those who you want to be engaged in and that if you are only coming in with your agenda and what you think has to be done without time, energy, is space to hear others' perspectives and understanding where they're coming from, it's really going to be hard to make progress. And, and this is really fundamental to our work at Global Health Corps, because oftentimes we get asked, you know, like, why don't you just do specifically HIV AIDS work or just malaria or just reproductive health or just government or just the private sector? 
And, and while it's messy, we absolutely think that bringing together people that have different backgrounds and different experiences and are more of an activist, or maybe they're more of an internal, you know, entrepreneur, intrapreneur, that really people that like to work in government understand how to navigate bureaucracy versus the entrepreneurs. So much of this still comes back to the understanding and the capacity for listening and humility and perspective in order to move it forward. Because yes, you can still have very different goals in mind, um, but also, you know, sort of you're going to try to move forward and you need to be working with other partners, which likely will lead to much greater success. You're going to need to figure out how to think creatively, how to adapt, how to be doing things potentially in different ways than you might have done them before. And that I think um, is another good transition into another question from one of our students about Global Health Corps work. Um, and it's from Miguel Ortiz who asks when considering programs for the fellows and the co-fellows, how do you integrate the opinions of the people in the communities that you're serving? So how do you, mm -hmm. um, how do you know what they want, what their needs are and then integrate that into your programming? That is a great question. And from the very, very, first year at Global Health Corps, we were very much grounded in the co-creation of our program with fellows, especially when we were tiny staff and this was all just trying to figure out what was going to work and what was going to resonate or not. It was from very deep, intense conversations with our fellows. We have quarterly feedback surveys during our quarterly retreats. We do in-person conversations about our programming. So for us, we have had a massive evolution of our programming over our 11 years at GHC, both because of what we've learned, also because the trends and changes, whether it's in global health or the newest literature that comes out, really wanting to be intentional about the communities we're serving, our alums who we're working with, or our fellows who then become alums who we're working with when we're thinking about what is the programming and I'd say too, I mean, in this time of COVID, we, so much of our programming and training had been in person. You know, a foundational part of the fellowship year is about building community. And you generally do that well by doing it in person. And so, you know, part of when we realized that was not going to be possible, you know, our programs team um, working with our country teams really worked to adapt what generally would be our eight day training institute in Rwanda to turn it not only into a, a sort of a shortened version of that online, but really then stretched it out over 90 days of a virtual training curricula, recognizing there's only so many hours that any of us could stay on Zoom and still stay sane, and that you're much more capable to absorb and learn and engage with others if you're doing it in smaller bite-sized pieces. So we've also really worked um, to both adapt to the circumstances, like many of you have, that COVID has presented this past year. And I think it's really also given us an opportunity to think about even when we hopefully sometime soon go back to the situation where we can be doing a lot more in-person gatherings, we will still be probably integrating a lot more hybrid learning for it to be virtual. And so for us, really this like constant um, reflection on our work, engagement with our community, evolving our program has been such a cornerstone piece of our work. And we have a lot of interest in the audience about hearing more of those details about your work. So what, um, what does the application process look like? How can people apply? Um, I think if you could maybe repeat the age range that people are allowed to apply. Um, yep. And then also the, the countries that you work in in addition to the United States. Sure, that sounds good. Um, and I'm glad that there's excitement. Um, our recruiting folks will be very pleased. Uh, so applications will open December 2nd. I'm sure we can send you know, information out um, through Julia um, and the Institute about application information. But what happens is that even before applications open, we work with, on a pretty rigorous partner selection process to first identify which health organizations in our countries have capacity gaps, 
where two young professionals can be filling those gaps that are non-medical, non-clinical. And so this is everything, as I mentioned, supply chain, monitoring and evaluation, programs, communications. And so with our partners, we work to refine what those uh, role descriptions will look like. And so on December 2nd, when our applications open on the Global Health Corps website, all of those positions are posted and all applicants are allowed to apply to up to three roles. Um, and then we have a five stage selection process um, that goes from you know, interviewing with community members to a last stage of you know, meeting with or virtually with the partner organization for them to make the final decision. Our fellowship year begins the beginning of July every year. It is a cohort process. Uh, we work in Rwanda, Uganda, Zambia, and Malawi for this coming year. We are planning to go back to our traditional model of an international fellow, which for now is defined as someone from the US who's paired with a national fellow. So for example, it could be the international fellow is gonna be doing monitoring and evaluation at Partners in Health and their Rwandan co-fellow could be doing supply chain and that they are gonna be co-fellows together working in their different departments, but also having the opportunity to work together in this 13 month fellowship where in addition to having real hands-on experiential learning of being basically an employee at this organization that you have a supervisor, that there is intensive leadership training and programming that's given throughout the year, which also includes a professional development um, award of $600 that you can use to build your professional skills we provide a housing allowance, so we provide a living stipend, health insurance, a completion award at the end of the fellowship year. So the intention is that these 13 months, you are covered financially. No one is getting rich off of being a Global Health Corps fellow, but that <laughs> the goal is that we recognize you are leaving your career, your job, your home, whatever, to be joining as a fellow. And so you become part of the community and part of this fellowship. I would say you're getting rich in other ways beyond perhaps <laughs> That is correct. <laughs> very, very true. Or it is an enriching experience. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, this is a question from Guy St. Clair in New York, who just is curious as to how your group selects the countries in which mm -hmm. you operate. And Guy has some experience in Kenya. And um, I see that Kenya is not one of your countries now, but how did you select the countries that, that you are operating in? Sure. Thanks for the question, Guy. So our countries really started from the, um, the early days of Global Health Corps when Barbara and the other co-founders were meeting with a lot of different international NGOs and ministries of health, sort of talking about this global health core co-fellow model and next generation leadership building. And finally, it was you know, a couple of people, including Paul Farmer, who said, just do it. You need to just launch this fellowship program. And he said, you can have fellows at a couple of our partner health and health sites in Rwanda and in Burundi. And then similarly, the Clinton Health Access Initiative also were one of our early adopters as placement organizations. And they said, we'll take fellows in Malawi. And so this was sort of the initial days of the countries in East and Southern Africa. For us, for many of our years too, we have had fellows in the US. And, um, and this has been important to us because of the recognition as we're seeing now more than ever that disparities in health equity are everywhere, that they are not just somewhere else, but they also are here in the US. We're currently on pause with our US fellowships because we're evaluating where and how we really think impact for our work at Global Health Corps can look in the US. So we anticipate making a decision about what our re-entry from a fellowship lens looks like in the US. Although we currently have more than 400 alumni that are US based that we're continuing to work with and supporting their careers um, and professional achievements. So, so all that to say, we really started where there was initial interest in our work. We 
quickly decided on a strategy, especially given the fact that we really wanted to build this close knit network and folks that who were going to work together throughout their duration of their careers to then go deep in our countries. We have the decision to say, you know, we could have fellows in 30 or 40 different countries and have a pair here and a pair there. But we felt from a tipping point perspective that we should be building out hubs. And so that's why we're now in Rwanda, Uganda, we've been in Burundi, we still have alums that are there in Zambia, Malawi. So really building out the hubs so that after the fellowship year, not only have they built strong relationships there, but that then they are entered and sort of ushered into this larger community who are still working and held, who are rising through the ranks and that together, you know, as we're seeing now through our collective action work, are able to make much greater change and make much greater progress in our communities. I, um, I worked in the Office of Global Women's Issues at the State Department uh, at the end of the Obama administration. And we also had selected Malawi as one of our um, gender-based violence focused countries. Um, and Malawi of course has tremendous challenges as, as does much of the world, uh, with, including the United States with gender-based yeah. violence. But one of the reasons we selected Malawi was because just the, um, the environment for seeing progress there actually felt really strong. So there mm -hmm. was buy-in from political leaders. There were a lot of health partners on the ground that we could work with on the health side of mm -hmm. confronting gender-based violence. There were education partners that we could work with on the, um, you know, trying to get girls to stay in school side of mm -hmm. that problem. So it's, um, it's funny because Malawi is not a country that most Americans probably think much about, but um, yeah. really exciting things happening there and exciting opportunities for progress. So it's, I'm glad you're there is. there as well. Great. Thank you. Um, I think if we can just turn back uh, maybe for the last few questions to your own personal leadership journey. And we do have a question from the audience, um, an anonymous question that says, women are underrepresented in all sectors of leadership. What were the most formative steps in developing your professional confidence? What obstacles did you face in this journey of professional confidence? Great question. I say sort of my early learnings or sort of opportunities. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, I was a management consultant early in my career, and it was very formative that I was in a small uh, sort of technology group within Anderson Consulting, and there were strong female leaders. One was one of the partners. My own direct supervisor was a woman. Um, I had a number of women peers that I was working with in addition to plenty of men, but really being able to see what their path and journey was like and to see someone is a partner and like this is what is possible and to be able to also have someone who I knew was having my back because uh, I did have uh, some definitely sort of early challenges from a gender equity perspective early on in my career where you would go to meetings and even if you were the one that you know was supposed to be running the meeting and then you'd realize there was sort of the deferring to the men in the room that it really took me by surprise um, because I just hadn't had that professional experience yet because I was in my early 20s. And so being able to have uh, female mentors to be able to talk about that with and how did they navigate that and what did that look like really gave me the confidence that um, that I could be able to, you know, be resilient, figure out how to navigate it, and um, continue to feel strongly about my beliefs and the opportunities um, and not just uh, say like, oh, this is how it has to be. And, you know, during my time as a consultant, I helped to start the women's group at Anderson so that we could have regular meetings and engaging with each other. I did my own volunteer opportunities um, for different women's issues, which felt important to me. And so that I think was sort of a strong grounding. And then even when I sort of left that all behind and drove this U-Haul truck um, and just talked to anybody and everybody that I could find in Washington, DC, I was really surprised by the generosity of people taking the time to talk to like some woman from Chicago who wanted to move from the private sector to work in the international women's rights. 
And that alone, uh, again, you know, seeing these people that were more established in their career, giving me the time was really an important part of my journey and is why I always and often, and you know, those of you who are on the line, you are welcome to follow up with me. I feel it's very important to pay it forward in the sense of, you know, people want to talk to me for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes about their journey and their experience or get my perspective on thing. I think that carving out that time is really important and really critical. And so the way that I've been mentored throughout my career, I think as I continue to get older in mine um, is an important role for me to be playing as well. People will probably take you up on that, or at <laughs> least if they're smart, they will. So thank you, yeah. Heather. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think you're right. Mentorship is so, so important. And um, just for, for all of our students or really anyone out there, like, you know, not being afraid to ask, um, others to share their experience and advice with you because even Heather's CEO of an organization and is still willing to sit down and pay it forward. And I know there's many people out there that share that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are uh, just about at the end of our time. So maybe just as a final question, I'll leave it open to you. If there's um, you know, one last thought that you wanna share or last piece of advice that you have for our students in the audience in particular, um, just the floor is yours for any final remarks. Sure, well, uh, first uh, again, uh, you know, Julia, a big thanks to you and your team and thanks to everyone, especially on a Friday um, to be joining in on the conversation. I greatly appreciate it. And, um, as my team knows at Global Health Corps, I can talk about leadership all day long. Um, and, and so it really means a lot to, to have you all here because I still don't think that leadership is talked about enough in the ways of what is needed to bring about sustainable change, particularly from our perspective at Global Health Corps through a health lens, but it equally applies to all the other sectors as well. And, and so, you know, part of our focus, as much as it's to build our community, is to continue to raise awareness about what does great leadership look like? How can that be modeled? How does it often look different than what many people assume it is? And how can we be working together to change that narrative? And probably a last closing, closing thought would, say, would be, you know, something that I mentioned before that I truly believe that everyone has a role to play. And so if you are interested, if you are committed to health equity and you want to figure out uh, you know, how you fit in, just keep talking to people and reading and building your networks and tapping in what Julia said. Don't be afraid to ask. I know sometimes it can feel hard. You can feel like maybe you're silly. Maybe you don't have a role. But our fellows have come from every kind of background and it really is more about your commitment to health equity, willing to embrace the leadership skills and practices and applying your own talents to this work that desperately needs everyone um, in order to make the change that we wanna see. Well, Heather, thank you so much. Um, we're very honored and delighted that you joined us for this lecture. And thank you to everyone in our audience for tuning in. Um, it, we really appreciated all of your questions and your participation in the session today. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, most of our Hesselbein Forum lectures are indeed on the website. This one has been recorded and will be up there um, shortly. So if you missed it or want to go back and recap anything, um, hesselbeinforum.org is the website and things will be up there um, soon. And I hope you'll join us for future events, future leadership development opportunities. And I hope everyone has a great weekend. Great. Thanks again, Julia. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.